So I'm going to spend just a few minutes uh, articulating, hopefully reasonably clearly, what our idea was, um, and then sort of actually the bigger story of actually what we, how we, what we then did to go and sort of be where we are today as breathing buildings. So the first thing was that we were a spin out from the University of Cambridge looking at low energy buildings. And the first thing that we identified was, it, this was known in the industry, that there is a significant opportunity to reduce the energy consumption of buildings. And one way of doing that is to just go and look at the number of buildings that are fully air conditioned, mechanically ventilated, and compare the energy consumption of those buildings with ones which are, strictly speaking, naturally ventilated. In very um, brute terms, you could say, well, isn't, naturally, well, isn't natural ventilation just opening the windows? Because using the forces of nature, namely gravity and wind, to go and do the job for you, that's certainly one form of natural ventilation. There are one or two challenges associated with that, which the industry will then tell you. Um, and I will sort of uh, suggest to you that those are uh, elements to do with control, and whether it's a nice environment, do you really like howling gales coming through your office building in the depth of winter? The answer is probably no, and therefore your first reaction is to go and close the windows, in which case you then stuff the ventilation strategy in your name that they're going to uh, be in an inadequately ventilated environment, which is singularly unpleasant. However, there are some very positive drivers to go and say natural ventilation has actually got a, a, a sort of a role to play in buildings. And that is, um, we're trying to create a lower energy society. If you just go and look at the energy consumption of the developed world, it's increasing year on year. What we know about the demand of the supply base, it isn't growing as fast, and some people say it's actually diminishing. So we have a gap in our knowledge of how we're going to meet that. And one way of doing that is to reduce the energy consumption of buildings. Building regulations, which is a form of law, of encouraging people to make their energy buildings is a very strong driver encouraging natural ventilation. Uh, energy prices, so it's not just in terms of what the government's doing, but uh, we're all seeing escalations in our utility bills. And frankly, if you think we've seen increases so far, that's nothing compared with what's going to be happening in the future. We've got big hikes uh, on the horizon. And then, uh, more recently, there was the carbon reduction commitment, which was another financial incentive uh, uh, sort of brought in by a previous administration, which was subsequently quashed very recently. However, the government is still saying they want low energy buildings. So what are the issues? The issues that we identified in the research program were these. Uh, drafts in winter I've already alluded to. Another risk is uh, we don't like buildings that are overly hot in the summer. And if you, you, know, if you think sort of we've got it hot here, if you just move a bit further south into France and Germany, what role have we got for natural ventilation in, uh, in climates like that? There is still a role, but you need to do something uh, else other than just saying, I want to bring in bucket loads of fresh air. If the fresh air is at 30 degrees, it's not going to be much cooler than 30 degrees in the interior. So you need to do something else. That's a challenge. And the third area that we identified was heating bills in naturally ventilated buildings are just heinous. They are large. And if you do it incorrectly, you're going to end up with, it's a lower energy building the mechanically ventilated one, but you're going to be spending all the money that you have on heating bills. And we don't think that's right, and we came up with a way of avoiding it. And the concept is as simply as follows, is that when you, rec when you look at the ventilation requirements of a building in winter, and if it's a typical classroom as an example, and you tot up the amount of heat generated just by the operation of that building, you will find that you get to a number close to 300, uh, 3,000 watts, 3 kilowatts. So that comes from, broadly speaking, anywhere between 60 and 100 watts per person. Multiply that by 30 people. We're in an engineering department, so I can use numbers. That gets you to 1.8 kilowatts. You then go and throw 600 watts of lighting and 500 watts of equipment. You soon get to 3 kilowatts. In old money, that's my age, 3 kilowatts is what we used to heat rooms with, a 3 kilowatt electric bar fire. We already have a heating system, it's just called running the building, but we've got a draft problem. And one of the problems that people have been using with naturally ventilated buildings is to cure that draft problem by stuffing a radiator in front of the, in, in, in front of the vent. And that is what is causing the heating bills to be so incredibly large for naturally ventilated buildings when, from an energy balance point of view, they do not need to be. So we came up with a concept, a patent, that we then filed through the university, my, my co-founder and myself, and said, this is the way that you should naturally ventilate buildings in winter. Go back to the, uh, the idea of bringing it in through the windows and out through some high level vent in the summer. That's fine, but in winter, don't do it. Recognize that the building is a furnace, 
and then use it as such whilst you need to ventilate it. So we then uh, took this as an idea and said, what is it that we then need to do to be able to go and make a, a difference in the world? Now I'm an engineer, I'm not a biologist, my wife is a biologist and she thinks this is rather funny. But actually there is one thing that you can learn as an engineer, is by just looking around, around you. And what does nature do? Nature doesn't say all the values in the nucleus of a cell. For that cell to actually survive, let alone add value to a body, it needs a few other things. So we just take this and say, I have you know, a cell and we're not going to just grow <coughs> based on a nucleus, we're going to grow our business based on doing some other things. And a very dear colleague of mine once said to me, there are more great ideas out there effused and discussed on a Friday night down most of the hostelries in Cambridge than you will ever see see the light of day. And the reason isn't because there aren't enough big ideas, it's because we haven't done the gathering of resources in a very structured way to go and enable those big ideas to go and actually uh, realise value. So the first thing, and I'm just going to go through the uh, the pattern that we did at Breathing Buildings. Uh, the order of these, there is some, there is some logic, but it's not, not necessarily this isn't the only order in which you should uh, think about sort of pursuing your business idea. But the first thing is, if, you ever, if you've got a great idea, make sure you're not on your own. Because a one-man band is the greatest way to failure. You need to have a good team. It doesn't need to be a large team, but it needs to be a team. And a team, your recruitment policy for your team is don't, don't put up with anything other than the best. You want to recruit the brightest and the best, even if they're better than you. That's exactly the people you want in your team, because that's the way that you are likely or more likely to succeed. And then once you've got your core team, go and get some more. All right, advisors, all right, go and get some friends who've done it before. You don't have to pay them lots of money, but make sure you surround yourself, and that's the value of these sessions, for example, <coughs> Enterprise Tuesday, making sure that you are getting networks in and that you are able to draw upon, uh, even if it's an hour of Herman Hauser's time, for example, which you might generously give, that is just an hour of time that you cannot put a price on. It is incredibly valuable. So making sure you've got the core team and then your advisors. And then making sure through your core team and your advisors, that you have begun to articulate how you think you might actually extract value from your big idea. What is the strategy? And making sure it's coherent, making sure ideally it's bulletproof, but no strategy ever is. It's just good. And making sure that you've tried and tested it with the people who've done it before. That's the value, of, uh, real value of your advisors, to develop a really coherent, robust strategy. Now, my advice, is that once you've done that, even before you've begun to think about money, go and find a customer. All right? You might think this is, whoa, how can you do that? If you can get a customer and a pioneer, someone who's actually prepared to go the extra mile and maybe even expose their jugular in terms of risk to go and adopt your idea in the form of a product, if that's what it is to market, that is the best thing you could ever, ever do. So getting customers early on, we call them early adopters in, in the business language speak, but go and find people. And that means going and networking, going, uh, your big idea probably came from understanding what the needs of the business or of the industry were. And therefore going and saying, I've got an answer to this, would you be willing to go and even implement it free of charge? But go and getting it ideally on a commercial basis. Getting somebody to run with you who wants to help you get your first product to market is absolutely crucial because it helps the rest of it immensely. So, customers. Now, once you've got a customer, you then have to worry about, well, how are you going to go and deliver that product? And what we did was we went to some local suppliers who we knew would be able to help us with the first product. They are certainly not the people that are making it today. Uh, they actually are one of our suppliers for a, a particular component, but they're not making the whole thing. And actually just going and saying, look, if, we, if you help me, there's, this is what we're trying to do, there's future in it for you as well. Maybe not in that particular role of making the whole product, but trying and finding um, somebody who's going to be a supplier for you is a darn sight easier when you've already got a customer in sight. So customer then gives you this lovely problem that you need to go and figure out who's going to help you go and make this stuff. And we used a firm up in Thetford to get our first eight units made. <coughs> and then um, and the IP protection is something I possibly should have put right, at, right early on. But the actual formalisation of the IP protection doesn't necessarily need to be on day one. As long as you've got somebody like Shai's team at the university holding your hand, and we did, from day one, 
uh, the university were extremely helpful in guiding us as to what different forms of intellectual property protection that you can have, and then making sure that whatever needs to be formalized is. You don't need to do it on your own. It, codifying the big idea, <coughs> this is where somebody in this environment, the university, can be immensely helpful. Actually, you know, we have, still have patent pending, and, and our uh, original patent was filed in 2005. So because it's not an overnight process, don't get overly caught up in it and allow the university, if you're going to use the university, uh, as one, I mean, they're only one way of doing it, and we, we did it because the, the research was funded through the university from which our big idea was actually spawned. But yours might be completely independent, and I would say you could still go and talk to Shai and his team about this particular area. You'll see that money arrives rather late in my process, and there is a very good piece of advice I would counsel to you uh, about this. The later you leave it to go and ask for money isn't necessarily a good thing, but the more you've got in place, in other words, if you've got customers lined up, if you've got a strategy already tied up, and you've got even a supplier base sorted out, even if it's just for the prototype, going and talking to people who might be helping you with your first £100,000 or whatever the amount of money is that you might need to get going, that conversation becomes a lot easier. In fact, you'll have multiple parties in all likelihood, if you've done your networking correctly, who are really interested in helping you. So the later you can leave it before you need the money, all right, which means perhaps going and doing it in your garage, going and doing some you know, uh, experiments of a small scale model to go and convince your customer or an initial customer. The first customer for breathing builders equipment he bought it never having, had a, never having seen a prototype. All he saw were some little models. He was so convinced by it. If you can get customers like that, then it's a very, very great way to start your business. Now, once you've got, when you get money tied up, and we got some money early on from uh, the people that funded the original research at the university, you can then afford to go and take on some small offices. But at this point, if you get a small amount of money, the last thing you should then do is try and spend it. You want to try and hold, spend as little of it as possible, make it go as long as you need, but making sure that you're doing all the right things in terms of making sure that you're spending money, going and talking to more customers, going and getting your strategy sorted out, sorting out the intellectual property. But keep your offices to an absolute minimum, keep your costs down. I mean, I, I spent probably £200 furnishing an office. All right, because I wasn't going to go and buy new furniture. I just went on to, I went and asked people that I knew were, were, who'd done, re, done re, well with their business and were then moving to larger premises. What do they do with their old desks? Throw them on the scrap heap or go and give them to, go and give them to breathing buildings for 200 pounds. We furnished the whole office for, uh, for that sort of amount of money. And that's the kind of uh, attitude that you should have regarding the first time you go and get any investment behind a company that you've set up uh, to go and uh, generate value from your idea. Once, once you've got sort of some offices, um, you can then start thinking about expanding your team. So we had a team uh, initially of just three of us, two of us on the payroll, that was it. Um, we went from three and we survived for about two years on a very, very skeletal team. And then only after we got some more serious money in did we then think about expanding the team. Clearly we thought about it in the strategy, but in terms of actually doing something about it on recruiting. So only once you've got a reasonable amount of money can you then start thinking about an expanded team where you start paying people. Interestingly for us, we spent very little money on our brand. So we used to be called East App Limited. The general consensus was that it wasn't necessarily a brand that was going to work for the future uh, growth of the company. Um, and therefore we then uh, changed the identity. So if you've heard me talk before, bad luck. No, if you've heard me talk before, you may have been under the guise of East App Limited. But now, uh, the company, as of about a year ago, is Breathing Buildings. There was a reason for the change of brand, is that we had this lovely um, problem of success, is that the industry were deciding to write down ESTAC on building plans, and they were meaning ESTAC as a piece of equipment, rather than it's going to be supplied by ESTAC. And we had this mixed message now, because the equipment was called the same thing as the company, we had to divorce the two. And frankly, there were so many people riding ESTAC on building plans, it was easier to change the name of the company than to change the name of the equipment. So that's why we did it, because the company itself also provides design services. It does more than just provide bits of kit. And that's what any company with a future will think about, well, that's the first product, what's your next product, or are there other things? So try to sort of, uh, if you're going to learn, don't make the same mistake that we did. Don't have the product the same as the company name. 
try and keep them separate because it does make it a bit easier. So we just had to reverse engineer what we should have done right at the outset with a decent name for the company. And right now, uh, we're expanding even further, but we're expanding in the form of partners to, to try and help take our product to market. We are not trying to bring in yet more money to the company at the moment because we, uh, for our particular company, we understand, we think we understand, what our core competence is, which is the brains boxes of ventilation. We're not the brains boxes about how to go and set up the cheapest manufacturing <coughs> facility in the world. And we're not necessarily the best at managing sales teams as well. So we're going to bring other part parties in, partners, who actually do those things for us. And especially going overseas, they will be doing manufacturing and sales, but actually we will then be giving them designs for ventilation systems. Now, I'm aware that um, I'd like to sort of have lots of time for Q&A at the end, so I was going to leave it at that uh, as a sort of a teaser shot. <coughs> but in terms of just the process, you know, the big idea, a dear friend of mine once said to me, that is at most five, maybe 10% of the value of a company. The rest of it is doing all of this gathering resources in the right way, in a coherent, uh, strategized way. That's how you really add value to a company. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Will West, CEO of Star Centric. Um, some of the things I'm going to be talking about actually overlap with what Sean has said, and so uh, hopefully it will uh, pick up some common things. Uh, just one slide briefly on our business. We're focused on epigenetics, that's things that modify uh, chromatin, that sort of DNA and the associated proteins. This is a new area of pharmaceutical companies trying to get into this emerging biology space, but finding it difficult because there's lots of fragmented information. We basically have come up with a business model where we can get intellectual property from multiple world-leading institutions, bring it together, synthesize it, and prioritize things that can be taken forward with therapeutics. We've sold programs, so, uh, therapeutic programs, to pharmaceutical companies successfully, and the idea is that we will eventually be bought by a pharma company. So that's kind of our business model. So when Shai phoned me up, he said, well, so, well you know, Come, come and talk to these people and tell them the few key things that you need to start a business. And, uh, and I thought about it, and I was actually on a train, and uh, I thought, oh, actually, we really need that, and oh, well, we need that, and that, and, and that. And all of a sudden, I had uh, a very long list. Um, I think the key point here is that there's an awful lot to do in that first period of setting up a business. Everything you do has to be right, because one of those things, if it goes wrong, is going to trip you up longer term. If you get the intellectual property wrong, if you employ the wrong people, move into the wrong offices, sign the wrong uh, rental agreement, it's all going to trip you up. But don't get paralysed. If you can't just do it and move on, you will stop before you've even started. This is my final slide as well. If you have anything, you have to have momentum. Your customers, the people who work with you, your investors, if they sniff that you're running out of momentum, you will fail. You have to keep on going. And that's a key message. So this is the list that I actually wrote, which ended up being quite a lot longer than I anticipated. Um, I suppose the uh, top left is the, uh, is the key one. Have a great idea that fulfills a need. Uh, yes, of course. Um, to reiterate a point that's been made twice already, is there's more than enough good ideas out there. It's making them happen in the appropriate way that's key. The next one coming down is financial resources. Um, not all businesses require uh, investment capital, and in fact, if you can get away with investment without requiring investment capital, that, that's a better thing. But if you do require it, I really strongly urge you to think about what type of investors you really want. If you're a small consultancy business, you don't want 300 shareholders who have 50 pounds worth invested in you each. If you're a uh, biotech business that requires 100 million, you also don't want small funds in you, you want a big fund in you. If you're trying to raise a small amount of money, you don't want a big fund in you because there'll be a pain in the neck. So you have to get that right. The other thing is, for the majority of businesses that are formed in the UK, there's an awful lot of non-dilutive cash that's around, whether it's seed money from various grants or whether it's all sorts of different collaborations and things like that. And certainly people like um, UKTI and Business Link can certainly help with those. Other things I'm going to uh, highlight. Well, actually one of the things um, I was going to mention, but from a slightly different angle, Sean, is uh, customers. Um, when I wrote this original business plan, I was thinking, well, you know, do pharmaceutical companies, are they really interested in epigenetics? 
and about half the um, pharmaceutical companies I went to, they were epigenetics, what? Proteins that sit on top of DNA and modify what genes get used. How can that ever be useful for therapeutics? And the other half were going, gosh, that's really interesting. That really opened something up. Now. <coughs> so that was six years ago. Now all farm companies are trying to get into it. But it was very interesting listening to them and working out how I was going to try and integrate what I was trying to build into their organisations and how to pitch it. So getting customer feedback is really key as you develop your plans. I've got a slide on people, of course it's absolutely key, and a certain uh, category of people which I call ambassadors. These are not people who are on the payroll, these are not advisors, these are not board members, these are just influential people that are really good to know and will put a good word in for you every now and then. And some of the key breaks in self sector progress has been because of ambassadors, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The list on the right hand side are all the things that you have to have to be a professional business that looks open for business. You have to have a good brand, you have to have a good name, you have to have a good um, website. You need all these different things. And there are certain things that can really help you punch above your weight and seem more professional, more open for business internationally. <laughs> Than others, so I've just got a slide on this too. I think you probably say this quite a lot, Shai, but uh, one of the key things about building teams and building businesses is networking. Network, 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 and more network. This is for a number of reasons. Firstly, aim high. Actually, Herman Hauser, who's mentioned previously, was a good break for me. He, is, he invested some of his money as a private individual, but also he introduced me to Gerald Chan, who is a head of a multi-billion dollar venture fund based in Boston, and they are now our leader's shareholder. When I was trying to get my first intellectual property agreement in the States and trying to raise money in the States, I was really struggling. They were saying, well, why should we interact with you, Will? You know, you're a two men and a dog company from 9,000 miles away, and you know, we're Boston. Don't you understand what Boston is? Um, and it was all kind of, you know, tricky I'm trying to persuade them that they should do business with me and not the person down the road. Um, one of the key influential guys that I met was uh, a chap called Charles Tate. He was part of Hicks News, Tate and Furs, a sort of KKR equivalent back in the 90s. You may know Hicks from the sports pages. He has a, a role in, uh, in Liverpool, you might know. Um, he was very helpful in opening up connections in the States that were way out of my league at the time. And so, for instance, he introduced me to uh, John Mendelssohn, who was, uh, he was on the board of Enmore at the time, actually. That was a different story. Um, but the other thing that he was was uh, the overall president of MD Anderson, the big uh, cancer institute in Houston, the largest cancer institute in the world. I got my first strong IP agreement with them, and that then rolled out so I could get their agreements with Harvard, with MassGen, Wistar, uh, USC, Penn, and it rolled forward. But it was only because I met um, Charles Tate at his country club once that it all kind of rolled out. The other thing is credibility. If you've got an idea, you've got to persuade people to either buy it or invest in it or be part of it. And so having credibility is really key. Um, our founding scientist is Azim Sarani, based here at the university. He is at the top of his game in epigenetics and worldwide uh, uh, recognised leader. Well, he then you know, because I worked with Azim, I was able to form an alliance with Bob Kingston, who's a professor and chair at both Harvard and uh, Mass Gen. He introduced me to Peter James, who's the uh, director of the Cancer Institute at USC, and then to Sherry Berger, who's at Penn. So that's how it cascades. But credibility is key. Having people around you that can really push forward that if you can't personally yourself. <coughs> Networking also helps you build a team. Um, in fact, I was doing a, a similar lecture to this at London Business School uh, uh, about five years ago, uh, and I was explaining what I was doing, and somebody in the audience came up afterwards and said, gosh, I'm a biotech, you know, thinking of changing job. And, uh, and what I needed at the time was someone who was really good at the detail and uh, good at contracts and stuff like this. And uh, Tim Fell, uh, was at a, another uh, biotech company at the time, um, did some consultancy for me, based on a meeting like this, and then subsequently became chief operating of the business. And really it's he and I that have driven the business over the last four years. Uh, my scientific director, I heard her speak at a conference. 
I thought, my goodness, that's the person we need in our business. I persuaded a, a friend to phone her up and say, would you be interested in another job? So it kind of looked independent, and she went, oh yes, so I knew I could go and get her. Um, the job discovery uh, director, again, was through a personal contact. Um, ambassadors, these were really, really key people. Um, when we did our first deal with a big Japanese company, uh, Tequila Pharmaceuticals, uh, they were coming over to uh, the UK for the first time. You know, they kind of heard of the but didn't really know him, and you know, stuff like that. Um, so uh, we were also doing a little bit of work at UCL at the time. So I got um, Salvador Moncada, to, um, the, the, who's the, uh, the president of uh, the Wolfson Institute there, to uh, come and give a talk about why the approach that self centric had was really better than anything else we've ever seen in the past. And I had this uh, 12 Japanese people going, my God, it's Salvador Moncada. Oh, you must really know what you're talking about. I tell you, it was really incredibly helpful. Um, Ulrich Muller, um, he was the guy who worked for John Mendelssohn, actually, at uh, MD Anderson. When I couldn't get initial agreements in Boston, I got Ulrich Muller at MD Anderson to phone him up and say, actually, guys, it works. We've got around all the federal regulations, and, you know, I've actually benefited a lot from this interaction. And Mikhail Preminger at, uh, uh, at the Whistler was another person like that. You've got to get the balance right. Um, you probably have heard separate lectures and talks on this as well. Um, there are different people with different roles. Uh, some people are leaders, some people are figureheads. You can't have too many figureheads because, you know, the VC will go, oh, I've got X, Y, Z involved, but actually they also know that they're not actually ever going to do anything. So you need that mix. In fact, my personal experience is, you don't need that many figureheads, you need ambassadors. You do need doers. Do know the difference between smart and intelligent. I mean, um, I, I take a grid, surround yourself by a bright people, Sean. But you've got to be clever, but not just intelligent, because business is all about being street smart, being wise, negotiating everything. We've we have negotiated everything. I don't think we've paid full cost for anything ever in six years. If you are trying to get into this business, and particularly in biotech, having a bit of experience is very helpful, and I would strongly urge that. Because unless you really know what you're doing, trying to get that street smartness without having experienced it at all is actually very difficult. <coughs> so, finances. A uh, quick summary of self-centric finances. One high net of individual, as I mentioned. Uh, we got four C funds in the early days, major US funds and the Japanese corporate. Uh, about six, uh, no, about forty percent now actually of our um, all our money so far has been non-diluted. Two big TSB grants, three million, two million. Uh, big SLC grant, about a million. With you know, even going to the states. I mean, you know, we got a, a six grand award from UKTI to to have trips to the US to try and build business. Well, it all helps in the very early days. We've brought money in from licenses, uh, from Tequila Pfizer, and we've got a collaboration with Sydney Aldrich. Don't think the finance side of things is easy, uh, particularly in biotech, which is very capital intensive. It's hard. There was a brief blip about eight years ago when it was phenomenally easy. I mean, you know, you've seen a protein or sniffed a protein, ah, oh, someone give you 20 million quid. Yeah, that was a brief hiatus in what has always been a fairly difficult. Uh, time to try and raise money. I've personally spoken to over 200 funds. I think I've spoken to over 100 funds this year alone. You have to get quite a thick skin. Um, I've spoken to more non-UK funds than UK ones. Um, venture capital in, in Europe is, is, is diabolical at the moment. However, corporate funds are particularly prolific at the moment. And even people like Bering at Ingelheim and uh, uh, Merck's Rowan Ventures, for instance, both set up funds in the last 18 months to show that they are filling some of the gap that's been left by some of the traditional venture funds. Um, there are lots of different types of grants. Wellcome Trust provide a lot of uh, resources and capital into uh, the sector. Uh, beware, they're not grants, they are awards that convert to equity, so they are diluted. Um, we've set up Self Centric Inc. to try and raise uh, money in Texas. We've the Dell Japanese funds. We've done pretty much anything that was possible, but we've nailed it mainly through one US fund and also a Japanese money too. This is my um, slide of less obvious things. Um, technology companies are international. You're not, you're not competing with other companies in Cambridge. It's an international thing. 
And therefore, you've got to be open for business all the time. And also, you have to punch above your weight when you are just four people in a, in a room. Um, a lot of companies, for instance, employ PR agents and stuff like that. Well, I have tried them a couple of times on, uh, on trial periods. And to be honest, they, they were absolutely diabolical and terrible value for money. You know, if you can write a business plan, I mean, you can write a, a press release, you know, the short of starters. Um, but one of the things you can do, for instance, is pay PR Newswire directly 600 quid. They'll translate it into Japanese, Chinese, they'll make sure it's disseminated into all the key uh, channels in the US, and you will end up on every single blog and uh, website that's associated with biotech through basically just uh, paying through PR Newswire. That would have cost you 50 grand for a decent uh, PR agent. Targeted press releases. We have a database of all the companies within Big Pharma that we want to know, uh, that we, uh, we want them to know what we're up to. And so we just email them stuff and, and look, make it look like it's an independent presentation or a independent news and news. We just fly them away. Um, articles as well. You know, get yourself in a tra get an article in a trade magazine, for instance, massively increases your credibility. You can sit in a room and try to persuade someone that you know, your better technology is amazing. But if you go, our better technology is amazing, and look, here's the article, they go, oh, wow, it must be true, that's okay. <laughs> it's true. The other thing is, befriend the key portals to news. Um, in, in biotech, um, there's a US website called Fierce Biotech. That has all the key news. Um, John Carroll's an incredibly difficult person to track down his day, runs it? Um, you know, I have phoned him dozens of times. But I finally managed to speak to the guy, and now we've got a dialogue. So whenever I've got a piece of news, I can phone him up and say, John, there's breaking news coming out. Okay, don't worry, I'll make sure it's on there. I've done the same for Squib and Biowatt. Never miss a call. Who knows? It could be Merck phoning up, saying they want to buy you. If you're not in the office, what are you going to do? Don't have an answer machine. That's rubbish. Um, there are lots of companies that do this. The particular one that we use is called Moneypenny. It's a, it's a lady, I think, who sits at home and with a couple of mates. The calls automatically go through to her. She answers the phone incredibly professionally and says, you know, oh, there's a meeting right now, very, very important. Um, I'll get them to call you back. And then she texts me or emails me. We never miss a call. How do we go? Absolutely bold. Um, great website. Uh, my wife works at BBC. Um, there's a guy who did all, a lot of the website for BBC. He sells his own business called Mr. A. I really recommend it. 400 quid, we've got a fantastic website. He's done a fantastic job. It might not be as cheap for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we, use a, we use a company called Shadow Facts as well for flexible IT support. Um, a lot of our business is uh, data orientated, and of course, we can't, we can't lose any data. And of course, tracking uh, intellectual property and uh, you know, keeping on top of patterns is, is highly complex. You have to have that right. So, we have, you know, dual servers and all this stuff. It's all completely beyond me. I don't know anything about it at all. I know Adam, who does know everything about it. Again, incredibly flexible service. He's, a, he's one of four people who works in this business, and he works like an absolute Trojan, brilliant guy. Um, where you work is important for a number of different reasons. I mean, for companies like uh, biotech companies, who, who are going to have big corporates coming to you, you've got to look professional in the part. If you get them to your pig pen, to do your presentation, they're not going to be terribly impressed. So we have a very flexible rent at Chester Research Park. We have access to all their video conference, conference facilities, full catering, and the offices are nice. You know, you actually want to go to work and get people there, and it's you know it's pleasant. So yes, we did buy a couple of secondhand uh, sofas to sit on when we debate things, but actually it's a nice environment too. And actually that's a personal thing of mine. That it is important to work. Somewhere. <coughs> so, uh, two more slides and then just for final point. Um, strategy. Things don't go according to plan. When we first set up this business, the original uh, uh, people who wanted to invest basically invested because they wanted a regenerative medicine company. And it was quite apparent that the regulations were not quite ready for a uh, regenerative medicine uh, products to come through. And so we switched the business, having <laughs> talked to customers and said, well, what are you looking for? Actually, we're looking after cancer targets that are relevant to the Right, okay, well, go for that, because people pay money for those, and they won't pay money for regenerative medicine products. But then you've got to split it out and be very disciplined about, you know, what's your objective, what are your goals, how are you going to do it, how are you going to measure success? You know, 
Just because you're a startup doesn't mean you can't be disciplined about how you build the business. You have to be innovative because you have to be separate from competitors. If what you're doing is interesting, other people will want to do it too. IP can protect you to a certain extent, but it can't protect you in your way. But also be careful because so a lot of people um, uh, confuse creativity with innovation. Innovation is creativity plus delivery. So just because you thought of something that's really fancy, unless you can deliver it, you're not being innovative. And for us, the innovative bit is actually it was how we managed all these complex IP relationships and made them all work. It wasn't necessarily about the science itself. So the innovation was more around the operation as opposed to the science. You have to be consistent, but you have to be flexible. I mean, it, and there's a couple of these. Um, there's, there's more on the second slide, which is basically you're patient, you've got to be impatient. Um, You've got to be consistent because if people want to come to self century, they've got to know what it stands for. Unlocking epigenetics. If you ever see self century, it always says unlocking epigenetics. We are an epigenetics family. Obviously, yeah, always, always, always. That's consistency. How we deliver epigenetics has been totally flexible. But you have to have this balance of consistency with flexibility of strategy. And always avoid binary positions. You will get in binary positions where your lead shareholder will go, well, it's Friday night, 8 o'clock, my fund's gone, there they are. I'm not putting that money in that I promise next week. Now, if I was solely, and this has happened, if I was solely reliant on that phone call, you know, the company would be dead. Fortunately, I could phone someone else up and go, look, you know you said you might be interested, look, how about you get a 10% discount and come in next week? Yes, you can move forward. Avoid following positions. Um, last slide, um, one minute. Um, when I was thinking about what type of resources there were, I was thinking more about the sort of, you know, the fiscal, but actually, it's a lot about your own resources as well. Um, <coughs> leading a business is, is not without stress. Um, and you also have to be able to pull people with you as well. You know, if you're asking people to basically take a job that is volatile when they've got families and kids and mortgages and stuff like that, and you're getting them to trust you to build a business with you, that, that's, that, that's something. You've got to be able to cope with ambiguity. Things don't work out. You've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be impatient, but you've got to keep on just going and going and going again. But on the other hand, when you're trying to finalise that agreement with the Japanese, <coughs> and they say it's going to take three weeks, it'll take at least three weeks. And you just got to sit down and, and uh, deep breath. You've got to be strong behind it. You've got to be able to cope with rejection. And rejection happens a lot. So you've just got to get used to it. And also, a point here is personal flexibility. Um, you know, I, my wife works full time, I've got three kids. I'm always making calls before I have my breakfast. I'm always making calls late at night because I deal with both Japan and with the uh, West Coast in the States. I travel a lot as well, and that is quite a commitment. So you've got to work out how you're actually going to do that. Um, but I suppose the last point, and, uh, and I don't want to get all sort of airy fairy, but uh, you know, you've got to care about it for two reasons. One is you've got to you know, care about your business because nobody else is going to make it happen. In fact, most people will go, oh, yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> Most people are going to be like that. So you've got to care. And also, it's because if you're going to build a team around you, you've got to care for them too, because they look to you. So, last slide then, just to summarise maintain momentum, keep going, never give up. Thanks very much. If you remember what I said about money, um, Money, come, for, for, for us anyway, was, was something that was relatively late on. Uh, we actually haven't taken any money from the local community because, uh, as Will mentioned, the UK community for certain types of investment at the moment isn't necessarily a very easy uh, dialogue to have. Um, what you really want is the right kind of money um, and with the right people behind it. And, much as though there are certainly people within Cambridge that I would talk to, um, because I happen to know them in terms of the network thing, I certainly wouldn't stop there. I'd go and talk to different types of money, not only in Cambridge, but different types of money, um, down in London and across the pond as well. Um, it's, and you might say, well, how am I going to get across the pond? I would take that as a fair challenge, but uh, it's a telephone call. Uh, it makes it a bit difficult when they haven't seen you, but getting, out to, getting down to London 
that's pretty easy. Um, and I, when we raised money, um, you know, I didn't go and talk to 200 firms when we raised money. It was more like 50. Um, and I, we ended up going back to the, very per <laughs> to the very first people we talked to. So why did I bother talking to the other 49? Yeah, you might ask, but uh, uh, it's not just Cambridge. Uh, definitely, London's a good place to go to as well. Will, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I suppose um, the only point that I would add is that you're not going to change things like that yourself if you're, if you're trying to run a business. Therefore, you've just got to adapt. You know, if there's no money in the UK, go to the States. You know, <laughs> if, 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 if you're trying to have an investment business when there's no investment, well, have a revenue-based business. You've just got to tailor your strategy to what resources are actually out there. And that's, you know, the venture community is suffering not because of anything particular to them, it's because of you know, glo the global environment. So adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends why you're doing it, really. Um, for me, it's about creating something new and different and having done it in a different way and proven that that can be successful. And again, you know, that sounds a bit airy-fairy and nebulous. But, 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 I mean, that's to me, is what it's about. Now, once you take money from venture capitalists, you've got to understand you've got to deliver a return on investment. Well, that's absolutely fine. That's completely aligned with management, and uh, you need to make sure sure that that's aligned too. Um, I, I think where you get more difficulty is not necessarily between shareholders and management, it's actually between shareholders, because some shareholders will need to exit in two years and some will be quite happy to run a business for 10. It depends on the life cycle of their fund and how it's capitalised. Um, so, you know, for me, having gone into biotech, you know, I, I will be doing another company after this and probably another one after that. So it's not necessarily about uh, being passionate about um, well, it is about being passionate about Centric, but it's about pa being passionate about making biotech science happen. And, uh, and there will be, and I will create, opportunities beyond this. In the very early days, being in the sort of the Cambridge area here had helped with the brand. I mean, you know, if you're a biotech company and you're, you're based in Cambridge, you know, that's different than being based in Stockport. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's so a significant part. Um, there are two competing biotech companies, both based in Boston, who've raised 10 times the money we have. And that's because they're based in Boston. It's not just because they're based in Boston, it's because they're part of the Boston community. Um, I mean, we looked at moving to Boston about three years ago, um, and, uh, and uh, specifically for money. And then, you know, having looked into it really hard for about six months, realised that actually we were letting the tail wag the dog. And, you know, even if we were in Boston, we still wouldn't be part of that Boston clique. So, um, yeah, it, it, that's kind of an interesting one. So, um, I think if, if... It's easier to raise money in the States, definitely. I would say it's even easier to raise money in Shanghai right now. Um, so, if you want to start a business, you can go to either of those places. But actually, I think there's a, a more fundamental thing, that just because you raise more money doesn't mean you're going to make a better return on investment for your VCs. And I think we're using our money in much, much smarter than our competitors, and we're more likely to get a bigger payola at the end. I will actually uh, comment on this. So where you go to raise money uh, is, you know, I have heard, you know, if you want to raise US money, go to the US and set up an operation over there. Um, I have heard that. Um, there, are, there are two things I'd say. One is, if you get yourself there and get known uh, and do the networking that Will mentioned, going to the conferences, the relevant ones, clean tech in our area. So that's certainly one way of building visibility and presence in the States. But actually, if you go back to the very, very first thing that I said about what you need in terms of garnering your, uh, your, your resources, and it's about the team, there is one thing that Cambridge has, and it's talent. And um, you know, I'm a product of this university of 25 years ago. I have been and gone, by the way. I haven't just festered here for 25 <laughs> years. But <laughs> I'm not that sad. But, uh, but, but actually, if you, want, if you want access to talent and you want access to young talent who's got masses amount of energy and enthusiasm and the passion to go and just do what is right, this university is just absolutely amazing. And one of the benefits that we've got by being stationed all of 
half a, less than half a mile from this department is that we're in close proximity to people and we do get knocks on the door. Um, and it's, so do you want to go, would I get that access? If I was in Boston, I, I know there are one or two other decent universities over there as well, but I don't know them as well. But I do know that this department, you know, or this university is absolutely phenomenal and we've benefited greatly. So I've chosen uh, for the moment to go and stay here. Uh, yes, we were looking for money. It would have been easier perhaps to go to the US, but the team that I needed wanted to be here. So guess who won? It's a very good question. So, I mean, and actually it's a very rich question in that if you ask for advice but don't pay for it, how good is the advice? So there is an element of, um, um, of you, got, you need to pay something or somebody needs to pay somebody something in order for things to start happening. Um, in our particular experience, because the, the idea that we had was uh, partly out of a university research program, uh, the university therefore had some intellectual property rights to that. And it was a, basically a very good conversation with them as to how we were going to go and uh, figure out a path forward. And the university is a shareholder uh, in the company. But in order for the university to extract value from the idea by being a shareholder, they were actually interested in the other things around, around the table. So at the very, very beginning, in terms of just crafting the patent, the university actually took it upon themselves to pay for the patent attorney fees to go and do all of this because I didn't have that. I, well, I didn't know who to go to for the first, you know, <laughs> to be blunt about it. And then however many thousand pounds it was, no, I didn't have that money lolling around in my sort of piggy bank at home and the university just said they were going to do it. Uh, lawyers, by the way, uh, you start talking to the right lawyers, um, they understand um, the sort of the startup. Uh, area of business and in fact getting what they're interested in is not being paid for the first hundred hours of work that they might do they're interested in you for the game thereafter and you have they will give you work for free as long as it's you know appropriately couched that actually if you do this then they would you're going to be in the longer term that's the kind of relationship that you go and uh, and it's about trust and networks so, but, you, but you need to pay some, sometimes you need to pay some people something early on. So there were a few, it was small amounts of investment that we got, uh, but so small that it's not really worth talking about. Um, and the university was generous in their time as much as, any, as, as anything in terms of helping get uh, breathing buildings going. Um, the customer did, yes. So the prices that we agreed with the, for that very first project um, more than paid for the costs of the supplier. It was a, on a commercial basis. And it was just talking with somebody who was a contractor, who knew the industry, knew what it was worth. We then went and figured out what the cost base would be and realized that <laughs> there was a positive differential rather than a negative one. So it was game on, we keep moving. Um, yeah. But, um, but actually, it wasn't just for that project that was helping inform what the strategy would be, because if you now understand, actually, there is a margin to be made in this, you know, in, even on the first project, there'll be a margin to be made in the next one when you've sorted out your cost base more accurately than we had to start with. So, um, if you just say, take a step back and just, as you just did, and say, look at the construction industry, it's not the world's most exciting industry, all right? In terms of, you know, look at the growth rates in the construction industry. It's been year on year, just a few percent in line with inflation, frankly. Um, what great innovations, is, what great innovations have there been? They haven't, as an industry, it's, in, so I don't, I want to be careful about what I say. As an industry across the board, uh, you could say it's actually not been overly exciting compared with aerospace and some of the things like that. However, if you go and look at an industry that, um, isn't overly exciting. The way I came at this was, look at the mess we're in, in terms of the amount of energy savings you can go and get through actually just doing the right thing. Uh, buildings account for anywhere between 40 and 50% of the total energy consumption of the developed world. So it is an incredible uh, opportunity. And if you then go and find a sector that is, you know, 
fairly sleepy, what a fantastic place to go to because it's almost a case of if you're half bright, you can't fail because you're going to have a, you know, the world is your oyster. So I actually say you go to an industry that looks a bit sleepy and you go and do what is right. Back to Will's point about care and passion. And we have it in abundance about doing what is right for a building. Um, it is, you know, it's incredibly important. And those are the opportunities. So, and you go and work with the brightest and the best, uh, not just in terms of your immediate team, but try and network. I apologize, I was a bit late. That's because I was down at Foster and Partners down in London, working at some funky building on the West Coast. You know, they called me up yesterday, and it's because this is a sleepy industry, and there aren't that many, you know, fantastic companies to go to. So, long answer, I'm incredibly excited. Well, I, actually, it's, it's, it's an interesting point, because uh, where, where would you put your growth? Would you put it in uh, pharma companies or in buildings? Um, pharmaceutical companies are getting a lot of regulatory pressure right now. They're having to cut costs, they're cutting R&D. Um, a third of R&D sites in Europe have shut in the last three years. So, you know, so, um, so where's the growth coming? You know, is it in buildings or is it in pharma? Well, you know, pe perhaps I should be sitting on a short store. Um, again, it goes back to this point that you have to adapt and you have to innovate and you have to still be offering something that is a solution that they need. So, just, so even if they might be contracting their R&D, are you doing something smarter that they still have to buy into? And so therefore, it's about uh, adapting your business for the changing environment.